पल्लवी पार्क विद डिस्ट्रिक्ट ऑफ एमएसटी All right. So, um, since you all have already uh, seen the Hyderabad implications yesterday, so we will continue. I uh, mean, today we will continue on that. So, also this is Madhma Astrophysics Workshop. Uh, so, one wants to understand first of all why they can get away with uh, hydrodynamics or magnetic magnetics. Why we can apply the fluid approximation to Uh, the plasma in astrophysical systems, right? So um, this uh, this probably uh, pretty cool. We told you about most of the visible universe is in plasma form, and uh, what are plasmas? Plasmas are basically ionized gases with electrons, protons, ions, etc., right? So when you have all of these particles, how is it that you can say that I will study them using uh, some continuum mechanics, right? So um, that is possible in the limit that the interaction between these all these particles is happening often enough, also on the length scales, uh, which is small enough compared to the system length scale. Okay. So the mean free path between all of these collisions need to be much smaller than the scale of the system. That's when the fluid approximation is valid. Correct. Okay. And and how so? Then you have to ask, what are plasma scenarios? Can we study under MHT? Obviously, not maybe all of them, perhaps, right? So um, you can can name your favorite astrophysical system, maybe the sun or galaxy or something, and we should be able to ask this question: What is the mean free path between uh, the collisions, and uh, uh, does that? Uh, look, be much much smaller scale system. So if to compute that, you have to know the density and the temperature, and these are the things that you can get from observations potentially, and also you can make some estimates, etc. And uh, what happens is that if you have very small density or very high temperatures, then the mean free path becomes pretty large. Okay, it becomes uh, uh, considerable. Comparable to the size of the system, and then you can't get away with everything. Okay. So uh, I have here the continuity and momentum equation. I hope from yesterday you are more familiar now. Uh, so the continuity equation comes from conservation of mass. Uh, this is an equation for the mass density. So if you have compressed incompressible fluid. Then the time and space derivative is going to be zero for the mass density. So you get out of uh, just del dot u equals zero, which is the divergence of the curve velocity v. Then the momentum equation comes from uh, momentum conservation arguments. Uh, and on the left hand side, I have basically a uh, momentum density. So on the right hand side, all the forces that I put in. Are basically force densities. Okay, so again, here this is the special operator that you must be coming across now in fluids. Because if you were dealing with just classical mechanics and just a particle, then you would be dealing only with this term here, but not not anything like this. Because now the fluid uh, particles are moving with the background, making them uh, go from one point to another. So you have to take the spatial derivative also into consideration. Okay. Um, so this is known as the advective derivative, and on the right hand side you have uh, the pressure gradient term. Uh, uh, so it's like having pressure gradients with which are more smooth around, and of course there needs to be a viscosity term which will kill the fluid flow in the sense that it will damp uh, it will decrease the fluid velocity, and then there can be body forces which which uh, uh, just don't work locally but on on all of the fluid. Okay, so you have to now uh, come bring in your conscience, uh, consciousness that you know we are dealing with plasmas. Okay, so though, the, 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 this equation over here is for a single fluid fluid, but underlying this is actually electrons and protons, etc. So you could have also thought this to be coming from a combination of you know treating. Electrons in the separate fluid and the 
in the ions at separate fluids. So you could have come from two fluids to a single fluid. So this velocity is basically the essential tension of mass velocity. So that uh, that is what is being written here. And uh, um, now the, the third equation, right? So I've written there is there needs to be an equation for the magnetic field. Um, why magnetic field? So we are dealing with electrons and protons and would be such large barriers and they will have some associated with electric fields and magnetic fields. But in particular, I've written for magnetic fields. So let's look at that. All right, so what I'm showing you here are these uh, pictures, uh, plots from um, observations of the uh, different astrophysical system here we have the sun. And here we have a galaxy. And in the sun, uh, these are these sunspots. And uh, uh, this accompanying picture shows you that, uh, which is basically a magnetogram, shows you that these sunspots are regions of very high intensity magnetic fields. And this slot basically shows that um, the magnetic field in the sun has a very uh, interesting periodic which is known as a solar cycle. So over a period of 11 years, the could try to exhibit some sort of scale pattern. And similarly, even in galaxies, I mean, galaxies, we do not have, we, we do not have observations of such large scale temporal patterns, but we do see from radio observations that uh, uh, the, the, the radio contours plus the polarization, um, the polarization data shows the magnetic field vectors uh, are aligned along the, the spiral arm of the galaxy, showing that there is a large scale field. So there is a large scale field in both sun and in galaxies, etc. So you would have thought that, okay, if I'm dealing with plasma specifically, there will be electric and magnetic fields. So what's so surprising? The point is that you don't expect them necessarily to be so large scale and so coherent, right? So there needs to be an understanding of why that comes about. So there needs to be an equation for mag magnetic field which tells you what's going on. Of course, when it comes to electric field itself, what happens is that because the fluid or the plasma is highly conducting, so even if there are potential differences that come up, it will quickly get wiped out because you know, there are currents in the system. Okay? So we don't see a large-scale electric field as such. We just see large-scale magnetic field. So this is the important thing. So the magneto is magnetic field equation plus no right? You have Schmelby's law, then maxwell Ampere law, and then Gauss's law. Right? So we have uh, equations connecting electric field, magnetic field, and current density. But they have been talking about plasma and flow and flow, etc. So the velocity has to come in at some point. So for that, we will introduce the Ohm's law. So the form Ohm's law that you might have come across before, it's more like B equals IR, right? If you have conductic wires and there's there's current through it, then if you, if you, I mean, there needs to be a potential when voltage, which will give you a current and there is resistance to that, etc. But when you have this plasma, Let's take plasma base, which is moving. And uh, if you have magnetic field in it and it is moving, then you get this extra term over here, you cross the thing. Okay. So um, actually, uh, we are looking at things in the lab stream. Uh, so if you were in the frame of the moving field parcel, then you would not get this extra term. Okay. So this all connects to Lorentz transformations, etc. Uh, on your anyway, this sigma here is the conductivity, and inverse of that is the resistivity. Okay. So now we have um, these three equations. Of course, this U finally connects back to the U in the momentum equation. That's the thing. And of course, the current density can be written like this. So it's basically charge density flux. Right. So we are adding. Uh, a contribution from both ions and electrons. And now, um, what you will do is to basically eliminate current density from these two equations and write down an equation like this. All right. And uh, then we 
let's look at this a bit more in detail. So what happens is that this particular tower in astrophysical systems is quite small. Okay. So why is that? Uh, one argument, one way of looking at it is like this, that this eta by c squared uh, gives you a time scale known as crop parity. And if you were to estimate this time scale, uh, so how do you do that? I, I was telling you that uh, any kind of viscosity or acidity is coming from collisions, right? So this term is proportional to the temperature to the power of three force. And if you if you take the kind of temperatures you deal with in astrophysics, then this theta by c square will be pretty small. Okay. So compared to what? Compared to the time scale on which the electric field is varying. Okay, so so we can drop this, and this is actually equivalent to saying that you are deal, dealing with non-relativistic systems. Okay, if you were in relativistic terms, no, then you probably cannot draw. Okay, so now you have an expression for the electric field in terms of the velocity of the magnetic field. Then you put it back into the the, the Faraday's law and then arrive upon induction equation. Okay, so this is the equation, the dynamical equation for the magnetic field because eta is the inverse of conductivity with F. So we just we just really take those two. Yeah, but uh, to get at this, you need to go to kinetic theory actually. Um, so the fifth comes from Spitzer resistivity estimates. If you want to just go and look at what. what. Alright, so this uh, we have this induction equation, and uh, note that we uh, drop the displacement current term here. So the the Maxwell Ampere law just uh, reduces to this where your current density is proportional to the uh, curve of current. Now let's look at the induction equation in a bit more of a detail. So uh, we have, if we open up all of these brackets and take the curl of U plus B, etc., then we get we should get four terms from this uh, first term alone, and uh, the four terms will also have a divergence of B and then you go zero. So the meaning you have three terms. Uh, then of course uh, curl of curl of B can be reduced to just a uh, Laplace of B, and uh, that is the diffusion term. So let's look at these three terms in uh, a bit more closely. So this is the advection term. This is the innocent term. It doesn't do anything much. It just transports the magnetic field. Okay. And unlike the case in your hydrodynamics where the advection term was the one that like uh, right, it was you know, non-linear term, which is difficult to deal with and so on. Here, this one is like an innocent term, and no much. Then the other term is B dot B U, and that is known as the stretching term. Why is that the stretching term? Because if you have like uh, some large scale shear or even random shear in motions in your uh, fluid, then that can stretch the field out. So this is the term that for that. And then you have the compression term because you know divergence of U. And so on. So these are the different terms in the induction equation. Now that we have brought in magnetic field into the system, uh, of course, that's going to have its own forces and that will uh, act on the fluid. And that's known as the Lorentz force. Here, what we are doing again is to basically add up all the forces due to ions and electrons. And uh, um, yeah, so this, this is basically doing addition and uh, that leads to J cross V by C. So now we go back to our equations of MHD, where, of course, the continuity equation remains the same. Um, and momentum equation now has this new term uh, that was in the magnetic field, the Lorentz force, and then the induction equation itself. Of course, if you want to complete the set of equations, then you need something for the pressure. You can have some equation of state, or you can write down an energy equation with this G and so on. Okay, so now let's look at the uh, the, uh, the Lorentz force term itself a bit more closely. Okay, so this is curl of B cross B, and if you then drive it to the right side, then you 
get v dot grad v and grad v squared. So grad v squared is uh, it looks like a pressure term, right? So uh, typically we'll just basically assume this term into the pressure term, the pressure gradient term. Um, and then this is the term uh, which is in the interest. Okay, uh, I mean this is the term which uh, is responsible for uh, producing. Uh, okay, let me just say this is the magnetic tension term for now. So the the effects of both terms I will talk about in detail later. So let's look at the magnetic tension term itself in a bit more detail. So you can write down each of uh, these quantities as some magnitude into the unit well. So large V into V hat, right? Uh, dot grad large V to V hat. So now if you take out the derivative here, uh, uh, then you get uh, V hat dot grad V hat. And then of course grad V where V is the, uh, the, the magnitude of strength function. So uh, again, you can subsume this b here. So you get a b squared by two, grad of b squared by two, and then you will note that the b hat here is dotting with this uh, del. Uh, basically, get parallel gradient, so parallel to the magnetic field. Okay. So this term gives you a pressure term. So from the uh, magnetic tension, you've got a pressure term, which is uh, gradient is parallel to the magnetic. Okay, and then you have this this other term which sits out like this. Um, so let's look. Let's now take both of them in back into F S. So if you do that, then you can write down the, the tension term like this. But now you can subtract this from that, and you get a perpendicular gradient of this squared. Okay, so this is known as the curvature force. So if you look at this, then um, physically what happens is that if you have a magnetic field like, like this, okay, which is kind of bent, then this V hat dot grad V hat is basically telling you that there will be a force like this, okay, which is trying to unbend the field, right? Okay. So the Tension term basically likes to unbend the field line or straighten it out. Whereas the magnetic pressure term, now that we have gotten it in this form, it is more easier to see that if you have like bunching up of field lines, then the direction of the force is such that it likes to unbunch the field lines. Okay, so it likes to make it more uniform. So in this form, it's easy to see out of these things. So this is what the Lorentz forces do. All right. So now we'll go on to um, other concepts of uh, uh, MHD. Okay. So uh, there is no, something known as flux freezing or flux conservation. So basically, what that is is that it states that magnetic flux through any contour C that moves with the fluid remains unchanged. Um, so, so what I'm saying here is that if you, if you have this fluid and you've stuck in this magnetic field into the fluid, it's now basically frozen into the fluid. Okay, This is this happening in the case when you don't have any resistive effects or the resistive effects are minimal. Okay, so this is the the limit of theta going to zero, the equals to zero, one the other. So, um, so you have this magnetic field which is frozen into the fluid. So as fluid is moving around, it will carry the field along with it and do various things to it and so on, right? So uh, here what I show you is basically a contour through which uh, the magnetic field line is partial. And now, uh, as the time um, seems, then this contour kind of changes shape. Then the magnetic field that is passing through this contour has to also rearrange itself such that uh, the magnetic flux is through this contour is conserved. Okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In physical system, if you put that in the contour, what could that contour be? 
Yeah. So, like, if you have some fluid, you can take any imaginary contour associated with elements of the fluid. Okay. And as the fluid moves, the contour associated with those elements of the fluid will also change shape. Okay. So, if if you are uh, if your fluid is moving uh, from a thin tube to a thick tube suddenly, okay, so then the contour has changed from a thin, ones, uh, I mean, basically a small surface to a small radius to a certain width and a radius. Okay, so that is what is needed. And then the, the magnetic flux nonetheless has to remain the same within this. What has happened is the area has changed. And that will lead to an interesting effect, which is known as the dynamo effect. Mm -hmm. But you will increase the magnetic field. Mm -hmm. if, because B into A is constant. Now you have increased B. So, I mean, yeah, the B will decrease. So if you were to go from the large, uh, larger uh, circle to smaller circle, that's when it will increase. So why do I say this is the dynamo effect? Is because what happens is typically in... Uh, turbulent fluid, you will have like these random shearing motions. And these random shearing motions will basically, if you're imagining like a flux tube, uh, which is there in this fluid, it will, it will shear this tube out, which means it will make this tube thinner and thinner. Okay, so when they make it thinner and thinner, it will increase the magnetic field in, in these tubes. So that's, uh, that's Kind of the dynamo, like the dynamo effect or increasing the magnetic field, etc. So that goes to explain the magnetic field that you were seeing in all of those pictures in the beginning, right? That there was this uh, same field and it was there in the sense that, um, uh, I mean, you shouldn't have expected such, such uh, strengths of field and so on, and that's because you know, there's some dynamo action up there. All right, so here to continue with this. Uh, we have changed the shape of this contour in time uh, because the, the, the flow has changed in time. So then what happens is um, you want to consider what happens to uh, like uh, this quantity D X, right? Um, and the way to look at it is basically that if you are associating one chota line element of uh, this, uh, this line vector, then um, dl cross u will give you the change in the ds. Yeah. Ds is the area. Of the area of the. The ds is the uh, the infinitesimal part of the area uh, associated with the action dl. So I mean, so you will have some contribution from here, here, and here, right? So they will all add up to uh, change to, to give you this change in the area. So now let's consider this phi, which is p dot ds, right? right? Uh, integral of p dot ds. So if I were to take the um, the time derivative of this flux, then that time derivative will, let's say, it commutes with uh, the integral, and then so you can bring it inside the integral, and uh, then you act it upon both uh, the magnetic field and the DS, right? Time derivative. Area. So because I'm talking about magnetic flux, right? So I'm talking about the magnetic field passing through an area. So that area enclosed by the solid curve is ds? Or yes. Is, is the integral of ds? It's, it's, it's the integral of ds. So, it has so the integral of this ds is, of course, the area, right? And what I'm trying to tell you here is that there will be this incremental difference, right, uh, in time. And so if you want to calculate this, uh, the, the change in that B S over a period of in this delta B, then you have to do this DL cross U because U is taking care of the yeah, change in length in time. You know what to do next, pretty much, that you are going to basically stick this in over here. And of course, we already know what del B del P looks like from uh, what we derived previously, right? Uh, so we also said that we will not take into consideration the diffusion term 
So we are dropping that out because this is all in the limit of diffusion being very small. So, um, so we have curl of u cross d dot ds minus d dot ds cross u. And now, so the Stokes theorem comes into picture over here. So then, then you can do this, right? I think that's uh, like the loop missing there. So yeah, so there is uh, u cross d dot dl, and uh, these are practically the same things, and so they cancel out. Okay. So what you find is the phi is conserved in time. So now we have uh, shown that uh, uh, that there is flux, there's something called flux freezing or flux conservation, all that. And also, we previously saw that uh, there is something called this magnetic tension. Okay, so these two properties of the of the fluid together render it somewhat elastic, right? Because you have this field which is frozen into the fluid. Okay. And now, you, if you bend it, it will it will it will not like it, and it, there is some elasticity rendered because of this new property in time. So, the so there are consequences of that, uh, but we'll come to that in a bit. So before that, I want to actually drive home one particular point that. Uh, uh, but there is something called magnetic Reynolds number. So, like we, you probably came across a pure Reynolds number yesterday. There is a similar thing called magnetic Reynolds number. So, that is simply gotten by uh, taking the ratio of the, these two terms. So, you can uh, look at it dimensionally, and that will turn out to be some UL uh, by eta. Okay, when u is the typical velocity and the typical length scale, eta is eta resistivity. So um, maybe already in the previous lecture it was uh, it was uh, uh, said that you know the Reynolds numbers in most astrophysical systems are pretty large. Similarly, the magnetic Reynolds number is also pretty large. Okay. Um, so if you look at planets and stars, it's ten to the power of three. In fact, Earth Earth Earth's magnetic Reynolds number is probably ten to the power of three, which is already considered quite small in in the in the uh, astrophysics in our you know, landscape uh, because everything else is much, much, much larger. So, so uh, stars have 10 to the 6, then galaxies, it's, it's crazy numbers. Um, so, it's, this is the kind of uh, numbers we are dealing with, which means in general, it gives you the idea that RM is very, very large. Okay. And which means uh, the flux reason. Is a very good, very good approximation. So you can take flux freezing for granted in astrophysical scenario. All right. And uh, the other point is, of course, that uh, because RM is such a large number, um, it becomes like a sticky point in some of these um, theories for dynamo or magnetic reconnection. Um, which are phenomena dealing with this in and the form of process MHD. Uh, so this RM being very large becomes a lot required. I might not get to it, but I just want to impress upon you that you know this magnetic Reynolds number is a, is something that you have to keep in mind. And the thing is, since you're going to be doing all these simulations, you also realize that you will never really reach any of these Reynolds numbers that uh, you will never really reach at present or maybe even in the so, like great computers later on, you know, maybe it happened later on. But at the, like, at the present time, right, we don't have that kind of resolution in our numerical simulations to reach these kind of Reynolds numbers. But the largest you can typically reach is in, 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 uh, in the kind of three kind of order. Um, so uh, if you're doing 3D simulations, that is. So you, it's very hard to uh, go to that limit. Okay, so that is something we have to take, uh, take as reality of life. So next we'll uh, look at MHD waves. So uh, I was telling you that, you know, tension plus that's what you think gives you some elasticity to LV waves, right? 
So, uh, how do we go about uh, and, uh, like looking at the solutions, uh, these various solutions? So, you you basically take a mantle's fluid in equilibrium, and then you perturb it, and that leads to some breaks. Okay. So, I don't know how many of you have done this kind of linear theory before. Okay. Right, so to to get at these various each of the solutions of the linearized equations, uh, so what you do is you take the MHT equations, uh, you take an equilibrium, and then you perturb it. So you give perturbations at some very small quantities, and then you ask what is the solution of the system for these small quantities. Okay, so how can we do this? Uh, so there's uh, let's let's look at the system algorithm. So let's take a fluid at rest. There's no velocity flow. Velocity flow is zero. And uh, then let's take uniform uh, density. Then uniform pressure. Uniform magnetic field. Um, now we will introduce some perturbations to the system. We'll call them U because. Anyway, equilibrium was zero, so this is just u. Then uh, rho bar, p bar, and small v. Okay, so the equilibrium field is b naught, and this is small. So what we have in our hand uh, are these quantities, right? The total are these. Uh, the the magnetic field is uh, v naught plus small v, and pressure is p naught plus p v. Rho is rho naught plus rho bar. U is just u. Uh, but remember, it's the perturbation because fluid is at rest. And so this u, rho 1, p1, v are all small quantities. Okay, so uh, the small quantities allow us to get away with some uh, approximations that we make. Okay, so what is that we will do? Uh, so you will basically stick all of these quantities into your MHD equations. So then you'll see that because we had a uh, uniform density, so the, uh, the time derivative and state derivative are on zero. It's an anyway, anyway equilibrium quantity. So the only time derivative that will remain is for the rover. Now in this case, again, um, you will basically have rho naught plus rho one, and then u uh, and then u naught is of course zero. So only right? So the terms which are uh, second order in fluctuation. So you can have rho one times del dot u. We have dropped that. Okay. So that uh, that is why it is called the linear field. Everything is linear. There's no non-linearity. Okay, you have rho naught into del u by del t. Here, because we have both v naught and uh, I mean the equilibrium plus, we'll take both of them into consideration. Here again, the only thing that will survive is a term which is uh, which is which has an equilibrium quantity and a perturbation. It has to be that combination. It can't be perturbation into perturbation. Okay, so we drop the perturbation into perturbation term. And of course, uh, notice that we have not kept the resistivity and uh, the viscosity and the resistivity terms. Okay. Um, then again, the, in, the induction equation itself, we will not have a uh, time derivative for uh, V naught, but we'll have time derivative for, for small v, then we'll cross U cross V and so on. And uh, here, uh, for the equation of state, we will consider isothermal equation of state. It's a simple form like this, P equals C S squared. And this is for just for simplicity, you can do other things also. So now what we will do is to assume solutions for all this. Um, what will happen is that this system will form an uh, eigenvalue. Eigen System. So you can solve this in this way. Okay. Uh, so you can assume solutions of this form where you have uh, things growing exponent. Uh, I mean, uh, things are uh, not necessarily growing. It, it depends 
whether it be grow or decay or you can have this. In this case, we are focused on the wave part. So here you have e to the power of i k x minus omega d, right? So from the omega and k, you will get some kind of dispersion duration and so on. You might have done like a sound wave version on the process is similar to that. So now, because we are assuming a solutions of that form, you know, wherever you have del del t, you will replace it by i omega because the exponentials will get cancelled very well. Okay. Uh, wherever you have uh, the spatial derivative, that you will uh, replace by i k. Right? So you will do that consistently throughout everywhere. And then you will see that what you can do is you can take this i omega down below here in the denominator and you can substitute this expression for b in here and in here, etc. Okay, so when you do all of that, you will see some nice things emerging. Uh, so you will come across this b naught by root of 4 pi rho naught. Okay, and you identify that as syndrome or else and speed in mean, the magnitude of this alpha velocity theory, the same way here. And uh, once you do all of this, uh, and uh, you can you can come upon an upon an expression like this. Okay. And this is just a uh, you know some imaginable that you have to do and then you'll just uh, get an expression like this. Okay. Uh, this is going to lead to dispersion relation for all the rays that I'll be talking about. It is pretty much the dispersion relation. You have this U here, uh, but every time you uh, demand upon certain kind of solutions, you you get things in terms of uh, UA, K, C, S, and omega. Mm -hmm. So, like, we will next we'll see that so this so one because you know we substituted this V over here, and then you rewrite the whole thing and you get something like this. Well, you can get rid of this U eventually. Okay. Um, actually, all of these U's over here should have been U till day. Sorry. If you initially have some uh, some uh, equilibrium U, yes. Um. Well. Not really, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the sense that uh, you will still have the same solutions for the rays. Um, if you but if that um, equilibrium U is some kind of uniform velocity, then it's okay. But if it is not uniform, how will it change? Okay. And like I had this general help of. If we take uh, terms that we are So, like, will it capture some more extra terms? Information or we just leave those down? If we uh, oh, no. just Yeah, I mean, eventually the system will, what will happen is all these perturbations uh, can grow potentially, not with waves and stuff, but if you have instability instead of, you know, if this omega was uh, imaginary quantity, then the i and i will uh, lead to some plus or minus whatever. So you will uh, eventually have some growing modes or decaying modes, etc. So then uh, if you have growing modes, then eventually the, the perturbations will grow and they will become equal to the equilibrium quantity. Things will become nonlinear. So then you can't really actually ignore uh, ignore the quadratic other terms, right? The quadratic term that we dropped, etc. So nonlinearities will seep in uh, eventually over a period of time. So now what we demand is uh, let's look at things where you know u is perpendicular to k and u is also perpendicular to b naught. Okay, and if we ask of uh, this particular expression for that, then it will lead to this dispersion relation. Okay. So where omega square equals uh, the alpha velocity dotted with uh, the wave vector square of that. And you can easily see that there's a linear relationship between omega k. So these are basically non-discursive waves. Okay. 
and because we have asked for you uh, being perpendicular to K, so these are transverse streets. So here I have shown in the picture uh, all these waves uh, will be like. So you have this B uh, magnetic field, and these waves go like this. The wave vectors along the magnetic field. How do I see that? If you look at the group velocity, then that is basically this U A, right? So that tells us that uh, the 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 propagation of the waves is along the field lines, right? They are transverse waves, incompressible, traveling along the field lines. Of course, there can be like an angle between uh, the wave vector and the magnetic field, so that uh, theta will take care of that. If theta is non-zero, then you can and so on. I'm going to this so that the incompressibility again comes from you know your perpendicular to k, so that translates to k dot u. Um, this is you tilde, I remember. Right? I keep uh, tell me what will be the restoring force in this case, right? So now we will uh, look at the so the other set of waves that you can get are uh, macrosonic waves, right? So here u is parallel to k, u is parallel to v naught, and so on. We get a dispersion relation which looks like this. Nevertheless, we still, uh, you know, dealing with waves which are not dispersive because omega and omega have relationship for them. So all your MSG waves are non dispersive. And um, in that case, because you use parallel to K, then you have longitudinal waves. These are some acoustic waves, right? Uh, compressible. So here I have a picture. So uh, again, the uh, the wave is traveling like this, right? In this case, theta is uh, pi by two, so the wave is uh, traveling perpendicular to the number of field lines. And uh, again, it's it, it was pretty much like a sound wave kind of stuff, right? Um, and uh, and there are two kinds of magnetosonic waves. Uh, one is the fast mode, and one is the slow. So the in the fast mode case, you take this uh, positive uh, uh, sign, and in the slow mode, you take the negative sign. Okay. Uh, the fast mode arises because here the restoring forces are not for the tension, but the other guy, which is the pressure. But you have two pressures: you have thermal pressure and you have magnetic pressure. When both of them act in sync, they are in phase. Then you get the fast mode. And when they're out of phase, then you get a slow. Okay. So we can look at what you get for omega square in in in, in the case of certain theta values. So if theta is zero, then you um, get this expre reduced expression. That's okay. If theta equals pi by two, which in this case, then the fast mode is simply k square into c s square plus uh, u a square. So you kind of add up all this speed of sound and uh, theta is the angle between uh, the wave vector and the magnetic So which I was uh, showing here. So in the first part, we just simply don't have the thermal contribution. Okay, I mean they are. Simply arising from the fact that you, know, you have a tension force which will act as a well restoring force in the string. Right. Okay, so you just don't have the contribution from the top. They are two, huh? But in the, case, in the other case, now you you have all the contribution from just the pressure force. And the pressure forces are, thermal forces are typically also responsible for your sound, right? Uh, so similarly, now you have a magnetic pressure also in tandem. Okay. Now they will both act in tandem and give you one fast mode and one slow mode. Fast mode is when they are acting together, and slow mode is when they are out of sync. They are out of phase. They are not acting together. Uh, the limiting cases like um, 
suppose let's take this plasma parameter, which is known as a plasma beta. Plasma beta, which is the ratio of thermal pressure to magnetic pressure, comes out to be C squared divided by U A square by two. There's a two factors speaking, but it's okay. Um, so if you were in the case where beta is much larger than one, so your thermal pressure is much larger than your magnetic pressure, then uh, you can um, uh, you know re rewrite your dispersion relation such keeping this in mind. So you kind of reduce it down to this, and then if you take the plus sign, which is a fast wave, you get omega square is equal to case. K square into C square. So the fast mode is pretty much the sound wave. Okay, and the slow mode will look like this because you know the slow mode will be the minus sign, so this will get cancelled out by, by minus five. But C square and C square will also get cancelled out here. Okay, so you will you will get uh, some a dispersion relation which looks like the shear alpha and beta for dispersion relation. So we end up calling it a pseudo alpha and beta. Because it is not really tension which is driving this; it is actually the pressure which is driving this. But the the dispersion relation looks identical to the shear alpha dispersion relation, so we call it the pseudo alpha. Now, uh, if we were in the other limit, okay, so that was beta much greater than one. Now, if the magnetic pressure is much greater than the thermal pressure. The fast wave starts looking like the alpha and beta, okay, and the slow wave goes to the 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 sound. The okay, these are not very uh, surprising. It's just that you know you have uh, thermal pressure acting strongly in one case, and in another case you have magnetic pressure acting strongly. So that is why you're just getting this kind of stuff. Okay. Kind of neatly put this on a on this uh, circle where. The radius is given as omega by k, which is the velocity, and the angle is theta is the same angle theta, which is the uh, the, the the angle between the magnetic fields of the vector. Okay, so you can plot this out. So the outer circle is for the fast wave, which goes from in the beta greater than one goes from C S uh, at theta equal zero to C. I mean. This V A square, remember, is very small. It is practically C S on this line. One beta much greater than one. But uh, in general, this this side is C S square plus V A square kind of stuff. And and this outer pink thing is for the alpha and shear alpha and wave, and uh, the inner blue is for the slow mode. Okay. So similarly, for our beta less than one, you can Give a fast uh, alpha and slow. So in beta less than one case, the alpha wave and the fast will coincide over here in three days. In the slow, uh, sorry, in the beta greater than one, the slow mode and the alpha will coincide in the three days. We just now discussed. So all. So with this, I'll I'll end my uh, lecture. If you have any questions. What are the like major open problems in like that chemistry people are working on? Oh, there are several problems. Um, okay, my favorite ones are on which I work on the dynamo and the uh, reconnection. Uh, I would have liked to tell you about it, but it was too much time. But dynamo, like I already gave you a little bit of a flavor, saying that you know you have to grow the magnetic field to sustain it. And dynamo problem is twofold. It is not just the magnetic energy that we have to grow to. We have to also grow the magnetic landscape. Okay, it needs to be coherent, and that is the open problem. How much magnetic energy is so? Because that you can see simply you can if you have random shearing motions in the sample, it will lead to exponential growth of the magnetic field. Okay, but the the length scale problem, which is the scale dynamo, that is uh, it's not clear how that operates. Okay, so that is one open problem. Uh, I mean, not clear meaning that you know you need to grow it fast enough, and you have only certain amount of time in the universe. So if you are looking at the things for galaxies, 
they are operating on certain entire scale and how many extends to you. So within that time scale, they have to generate wave flux peaks or much before intro. Uh, because there are observations that go back to the thread shifts, which show that there are magnetic fields which have sizable uh, uh, sorry, there are galaxies with sizable magnetic fields even at an earlier time zone. So, so you have to uh, get these large scale fields within certain time scale as a child that are in being pretty large because it's the key problem. It's a key issue. You will find that these uh, uh, growth rate become a function of RM and one which very like so that's the problem. Then uh, uh, in case of uh, uh, reconnection, basically you have these anti parallel magnetic field lines. See, in the earlier case, in the Dynamo case, you're converting the kinetic energy into magnetic energy. You know, the flow is doing things to the field and growing it. Okay. But in the reconnection case, what happens is you have these anti parallel magnetic field lines coming and interacting with each other. And at the interface, you will have, because you know, gradient of phase, so you will have a current sheet process. So the current sheet will uh, facilitate uh, uh, because eta will be large at that point. I mean, eta's um, uh, effect will be large at that point. So it will break the field line and then they will reconnect. Okay. So they come, they will reconnect and then we see it. Okay. So, um, that is the problem where you know you convert on magnetic energy into kinetic energy. Yeah. Okay, so this is a favorite uh, uh, model to explain solar flares. Yes. Okay, uh, so it, it can explain like uh, some violent, uh, uh, yeah, intermediate violence in uh, astrophysics uh, is it can be new, uh, can be modeled based on definition. So these are the two things. Uh, well, there are many instabilities and uh, uh, yeah, MII. Uh, uh, then uh, yeah, there are many instabilities in galaxy clusters and uh, so on. In the sun, you have micro convection. So many astro uh, magnet MHT related interesting phenomena. Uh, then uh, of course you also need magnetic fields to you know. Uh, guide uh, particles and uh, so there are a lot of particles. Some cosmic rays. So magnetic fields come into that also. I have read that uh, this omega is negative or imaginary. So also it will create an instability. Mm -hmm. So is it possible in this relation that we get omega is negative? Sure. Uh, because we are looking at waves, right? Here will not get any instability. Because you know the surface is such that you will not get a cancer. You are just, you know, like perturbing some uniform magnetic field like this, like strings. And so nothing will happen really. There is no instability. You can have like a shear background shear of flow or something. Then that that will that can lead to it because shear of flow will like move things to magnetic field and so on. So uh, if you have, for example, both uh, if you have a differential rotation, both background shear plus rotation that will lead to something known as magneto rotation and instability. Okay. Uh, then uh, that is very important to numerous objects and to explain that luminosity, MHT is the save end of the day. Okay. Hydrodynamics actually will not uh, necessarily work in the kind of Hyperion this that we think. So is it kind of like yes it's, uh, as you said that the magnetic field either increases or decreases as the shape changes. So what causes that? So, so this, uh, we said the flux is conserved. Mm -hmm. But what is flux? Flux is like V into A, right? Take uh, just uh, roughly V into A equals constant, right? Now, uh, what you, like if we are thinking of a flux tube, this V into A is constant for the flux tube. Now, some shearing motion will shear out the flux too, and so it will reduce. Okay, so as a consequence, because V into A has to be constant, V will increase. So, my question is like, what increases that physical thing? Oh, because the free energy is coming from just the fluid motion. 
right? Because it's sharing stuff. It's the fluid is sharing the field now. So um, the, there is a transfer of kinetic energy to magnetic energy in this process. 